On January 3, 1949, Oba Samuel Ladakbo Ademola, the seventh Alaki of Egba land, Abiyokuta, abdicated the throne due to strife with Egba women in a protest led by Formula Ransom Kuti on the issue of taxation. The women were made to pay heavy taxes and were also allegedly maltreated. After these months and years of protest, the Alaki, who was seen as a stooge of the British colonial masters, was removed and forced out of his palace at Aki and exiled to Bumosho. Other records say Oshogbo, where he stayed until December 1950. The intrigues of this event are the focus of this video. First, who was familiar with Ransom Kuti? Ransom Kuti was born Francis Abigail Olufumilayo Thomas to Daniel Olumuiwa Thomas and Lucretia Phyllis Omoyeni Adi Oshulu on October 25, 1900. She was a teacher, political campaigner, women's rights activist, and a traditional aristocrat. Ransom Kuti served with distinction as one of the most prominent leaders of her generation. Her political activism led to her being described as the doyen of female rights in Nigeria as well as to her being regarded as the mother of Africa. Early on, she was a very powerful force advocating for the Nigerian woman's right to vote. She was described in 1947 by the West African pilot as the lioness of Lishabi on a campaign against their illogical taxation. That struggle led to the abdication of the Egba High King Obademola II in 1949. Fumilayo Ransom Kuti was raised by parents who valued education and became the first girl student to be admitted to Abekuta Grammar School, hence a nickname, Bere, which means the first girl child in Yoruba. She later went to England for further studies. She soon returned to Nigeria and became a teacher. On January 20, 1925, Fumilayo married the Reverend Israel Olodoton Ransom Kuti who also defended the commoners of his country and was one of the founders of the Nigerian Union of Teachers and the Nigerian Union of Students. The marriage was blessed with four children, Olikoye, Beko Lari, Olufela, and the girl, Oludolapo. In 1918, Governor General Lugard had introduced a system of direct taxation and created the sole native authority, which was a form of indirect rule whereby the traditional rulers acted as agents for the colonial government. The sole native authority, equivalent to today's local government, was headed by the Alaki. It had far-reaching powers and all the previous checks and balances on the power of the Alaki was eroded under the indirect rule system as kingmakers, chiefs and priests who could act to limit the abuse of power of the Alaki were now dependent on the sole native authority for their appointments to advisory councils. In plain words, they were rendered effeminate. Before the advent of the British, women had participated in politics and had their own representatives. The most important was the Yalu on State Councils, whose duty was to protect and promote women's interests. When they came, that is the British, it never occurred to them that women had any significant role and so they never made any provision for it. Nevertheless, some women titles like Yaludi and Erelu remained, but they lacked power and influence. The aching issue for the Egba women was taxation. Having been subjected to tax by the colonial government, they provided as much as one half of district revenues, yet they had no direct representation of the sole native authority council, a situation they hated so much. Further, the manner by which taxes were collected was often through insults, violence, chasing of women, beatings, and stripping of young women ostensibly to assess their age. As time went on, complaints increased, reaching a point where women decided that their only chance to gain redress of their grievances was a more militant approach. They considered the tax as foreign, unfair, and excessive. They also objected to the method of collection. This was the one issue that catapulted Formula Ransom Kuti into the political limelight, first in Abeokuta and then in Nigeria. <music>
In 1923, Fumilai Ransom had organized a group of young girls and women into the Abekuta Ladies Club. The group was made up of Western educated middle class and mostly Christian women who concentrated on crafts and social etiquette. Around 1943-1944, the Abekuta Ladies Club regrouped and expanded to include market women who had approached Ransom Kuti to explain their ordeal to her. Most of these women were uneducated and it was at this point that Formula Ransom Kuti began her political activism, encouraging learning among the adults and thereby wiping out illiteracy. Formula Ransom Kuti was appalled to hear of the level of exploitation by the colonial and urbanative authority, harassment by police and representatives of the Alaki against women. She discovered that the Alaki, the traditional ruler of Abeokuta, was allegedly diverting confiscated rice to his own stores, selling it and pocketing the profits. The rice had been confiscated by the government from women traders. In 1946, the burden of taxation became unbearable and the Abekuta Ladies Club metamorphosed into Abekuta Women's Union. This was designed to challenge both colonial rule and the male controlled structure. Through the union, they opposed price controls and the imposition of direct taxation, engaged in press campaigns, and mobilized so much pressure against the Alaki. The Abekuta Women's Union was a well-structured and disciplined organization. Mass refusal to pay the tax combined with an enormous protest led to a brutal response from the authorities as tear gas was deployed and beatings were administered. Ransom Kuti ran training sessions on how to deal with this threat, teaching women how to protect themselves from the effects of tear gas and how long they had to throw the canisters back to the authorities. In late 1946, the Alaki increased tax rates for women. Thousands of women marched to the palace to protest these increases. The Alaki's only response was that if any woman felt her taxes were too high, she should appeal to him individually. It seemed there was nothing to achieve, so the Abekuta Women's Union, through their leader, Fumla Ransom Kuti, engaging in a tremendous letter-writing effort, outlined the women's grievances to newspapers in Lagos and Abiokuta. A mass movement was organized and they laid down objectives, some of which included 1. Resistance against the poll tax, 2. Resistance against harsh enforcement of sanitation regulations, the payment of water rates, and finally, the removal of the Alaki from office. The Alaki was vigorously criticized since he was considered the personification and symbol of the sole native authority to the detriment of his people's well-being. Although the colonial government was the real source of power, the Abekuta Women's Union attacked its agents, that is, the sole native authority and the Alaki. They challenged the Alaki's abuses of food and price controls and his interference in trade and court matters. He was also accused of demanding sex from some women who had left their abusive spouses to take refuge in his palace and charging them for accommodation. In addition, the Abekuta Women's Union called for representation of women on all bodies that administered Egba affairs by members of the union. The rationale was that since the men had not protected their rights, women's representatives were needed to do so. The anti-tax protest was a long one, with Fumila Ransom Kuti at the head leading the women in the struggle. In 1947, Fumila Ransom Kuti refused to pay her taxes and she was arrested. At her arraignment, where she pleaded not guilty, thousands of women congregated at the courthouse to demonstrate their support. The next year, she again refused to pay her taxes. She led the Abekuta Women's Union in laying down plans for a systematic program of mass protests. The first major demonstration was held on November 29 and 30, 1947. Many women took part. As they neared the Alakis Palace, Ransom Kuti commanded the marchers to stop, closed her eyes, and told them that all those who were afraid should leave while her eyes were closed. Nobody left. They all maintained vigil during which they sang abusive songs. In reference to the Abba Women's Riot of 1929, the women were careful to stress the importance of not allowing the authorities to use any excuse to attack them or use violence by making sure no weapon was carried. Many women were jailed but were later released 
In January 1948, Ransom Kuti was banned from the palace for insulting the Alaki and the British administration supported it. Administrative attempts to woo away the Abiy Kuta Women's Union executive from its support of Ransom Kuti failed. They also refused to attend any meeting without their leader. By April 1948, the women were determined to get rid of the Alaki and obtain their demands, one of which were included that the Alaki be removed from office. They continued their demonstrations and vowed to go on the streets in nudity, a taboo in Abekuta as of the time. As they got to the palace, they blocked the two main colonial officers, the resident and district officer, from leaving the palace. As they protested, they sang abusive songs in Yoruba. To gain time, the Alaki decided to go for a holiday at the beginning of June in Jaws, hoping things would cool off in his absence. He appointed a special committee to investigate the complaints of the women. He also suspended their taxation and agreed to women representatives on the central committee. Alas, the women were no longer interested in anything he did. They were only interested in his abdication. So they continued their demonstrations. After he returned, the Alaki ceded further ground by resigning his position as head of the sole native authority. But the women would not budge and blandly refused to accept nothing less than his total abdication and continued their protests. In July, the Egba chiefs and members of the Egba Native Authority passed a resolution against the sole native authority system. They also charged the Alaki with corruption and abuse of power. They then rejected him as king, rang the bell, and beat the traditional drums to seal the decision. Finally, on January 3, 1949, the Alaki abdicated. The women's protest, which had intensified from October 1946, to July 1948 had been successful. For women, all executives of the Abekuta Women's Union, including from Lyra and Kuti, were appointed to the Egba Central Council that replaced the sole native authority and the women taxation was also abolished. Certainly, Obademola had attracted considerable opposition for his misuse of power in the course of his long reign of 28 years up to the abdication. However, there remained a powerful group of loyalists who were committed to the Alaki. This group launched a vigorous campaign against his abdication and against the selection of another monarch in his stead. Chief Kushimo, the Oluo of Ake, Chief Adeli, the Ashikpa of Egba, led other chiefs to disclaim the resolution of the Central Council that the government should not allow the return of the Alaki. The chiefs also did not accept the resolution reportedly signed by 10,000 Egba citizens as credible or authentic. They ultimately achieved the reinstatement of the king after nearly two years in exile. After this episode, the embattled Alaki was welcomed back and thereafter he ruled with wider support and became the senior in order of precedence in the Western House of Chiefs. In spite of the glaring abuses against the Alaki and the desire of the Egba people to elect a new one, British colonial officials, in connivance with ethno-political entrepreneurs, returned him to the throne secretly in December 1950 without the necessary mandate. Oba Samuel Ladakwa Ademola II would rule for 12 more years until his death in 1962. He remains the longest reigning Alaki of Abekuta to date. One of his children by his marriage to Tejuma de Alakija, a sister of the famous Adiyemo and Olainka Alakija, was Sir Aditukumbo Adimola, the first indigenous chief justice of Nigeria. As a result of the success of the Abekuta Women's Union, Fumila Ransom Kuti decided to expand its organizational structure on a trans-ethnic and trans-regional basis, changing its name to the Nigerian Women's Union as branches were opened in Aba, Benin, Calaba, Enugu, Ibadan, Kano, and Lagos. The union continued to operate literacy classes in addition to maternity and child welfare classes. However, it remained a special interest group and did not attempt to engage in overtly political action on a national scale. If you would like to know more about the latter life of Mrs. Fumila Ransom Kuti and how she was murdered by some unknown Nigerian soldiers in 1978, do check that out in our next video. <music>